On the 27th of July, 1890, a gunshot was heard near the French village of auvers sur -Oise. It was the sound of suicide, the last desperate act of a sick man. His name was Vincent van Gogh. Two days later, a life of struggle was finally at an end. When he died, Van Gogh was 37 years old and almost completely unknown. Only one of his paintings had ever been sold. He had experienced loneliness, persecution, and ultimately the madness that led to suicide. But his death also marked the beginning of his legend. Before long, it became obvious that Van Gogh had been an artist of genius. By the early 1900s, his paintings were recognized as masterpieces, and the story of his sad, earthly life became increasingly well known. The story of how he once cut off his own ear is now amongst the best-known tales of art history. But the life of Vincent van Gogh would not be so compelling were it not for the greatness of his art, all of it created in a handful of years prior to his death. His works are now amongst the best-known images of Western art, and their financial value runs into tens of millions. This is just one measure of the astonishing achievement of Vincent van Gogh. Van Gogh blasted aside conceptions of art with his huge brushstrokes, sweeping patterns. He used paint to express pure emotion in a way that no one else certainly was doing at that time and hasn't been able to do quite the same since. He was concerned with people and the human being, the human condition, in other words, human emotion, and that that was something which had, in a sense, in the Renaissance, had rather got um, undervalued. And to free, just as others freed colour, Van Gogh himself freed colour as well, because that was an essential part of what he was doing. But, for instance, both Gauguin and Cezanne, in different ways, freed colour, as had uh, Monet and Seurat and people like that. And so his significance, I think, is that he brings this other dimension very violently into the foundations of, of modern art, of emotion. Van Gogh was born on the 30th of March, 1853, in the Dutch village of Groot Zandart. He was the eldest son of the local Protestant pastor, a quiet, withdrawn boy who enjoyed sketching the flat landscape of his homeland. By the age of 16, he started a career in the artistic world, not as an artist, but as an apprentice to an art dealer. Though he hardly produced any creative work of his own, the young Vincent's job brought him into contact with many great paintings. In the Netherlands, he admired the Dutch masters, Rembrandt and Hals. In London, he developed a taste for John Constable. And in Paris, he became familiar with the work of Camille Corot and Francois Millet. Whilst working in London, he developed an infatuation for his landlady's daughter. Her eventual rejection hit him hard, and Vincent would never be able to form a lasting relationship with any woman. He also had problems at work. In March 1876, he was sacked from the Paris branch of Goupil's. His offence had been to tell his superiors what he thought of the art business. Over the following three years, Van Gogh worked as a teacher in England. He attempted to train as a priest and spent several months as an evangelist in Belgium's grim mining region, the Borinage. But this too ended in dismissal. It was said that he took the Christian message of charity too literally, and his superiors were unimpressed with a preacher who dressed in rags having given away his best clothes. He tried very hard, uh, thinking he would follow in his father's footsteps in religious life and doing missionary work. He got so involved in that 
that he worried his superiors who felt that he was in fact more of a danger than a help. Uh, one of the reasons that his superiors uh, were upset was he got too involved, too involved with the people. He actually gave his own money away and clothing and, and everything else. Art had been in his family, he'd shown a precocious talent. Uh, his brother Theo, I think, was the steadying influence who guided him and introduced him to contemporary artists. Vincent was now 26 years old and unemployed. In the summer of 1879, he made the decision to become an artist. The results would be astonishing. Theo had suggested that Van Gogh become an artist and Van Gogh dismissed the idea. Later on he became ill and in his convalescence he started to follow Theo's advice and he began sketching and painting. And he went on from there, really, and he transferred his interest in the poor and the underprivileged, to not, not to preaching at them, but actually to drawing them and painting them. Van Gogh's most famous paintings were a long way off when he first decided to be a full-time artist. By 1879, Vincent had done little more than the occasional drawing. He knew that there was much to learn if he was to make it as a professional. So he began to study textbooks of anatomy and perspective, and he copied the works of Millet. But he soon realized that isolated study was not enough. So, in October 1880, he moved on again to Brussels. Here, he was able to attend classes at the Art Academy, and he established a friendship with a wealthy fellow student, Anton van Rappa. He began to produce gloomy drawings inspired by his time in the Borinage, and he was able to devote himself full-time to his studies thanks to the generous financial support of his brother. Theo van Gogh was six years younger than Vincent, and unlike his brother, he was happy to work for Goupil's. When Vincent moved to Brussels, Theo began to send him money. It would be a continuing arrangement documented in the brothers' letters to each other. Hundreds of these survive, and they remain vital documents for the student of Vincent van Gogh. His letters to Theo did not confine themselves to everyday matters such as money. They also revealed intricate details of his art and his artistic philosophy. We get to know the man himself, his hopes and fears, his aspirations, his disappointments. But really, his very deep and serious uh, uh, concern about his art and about the human condition. In no superficial way at all, this is somebody who is awesome in his seriousness. We here have a man of considerable intellectual and spiritual depth. And I think that helps us to understand also, to put in context, the mythology. They give us his thoughts and ideas and beliefs. He was writing them to Theo, so he expressed himself very directly and very honestly. And we have enormous amounts of information about what he felt about painting and life in those letters. The only gaps in the correspondence between Theo and Vincent date from the periods when they lived together. In the spring of 1881, they both found themselves at the new family home in Etten. But personal problems soon returned. That summer, Vincent fell in love with his cousin, only to find himself rejected once more. He was also losing his Christian faith, a real problem in a pastor's household. At the end of 1881, following an argument with his father, the nomadic Vincent moved on again, back to the Dutch capital, The Hague. There, he made the bizarre decision to live with a homeless prostitute known as Sien, whom he depicted in a canvas entitled Sorrow. His sense of Christian charity had not deserted him, but Vincent eventually realized that the relationship was affecting his ability to work. By the time of his 30th birthday in March 1883, Van Gogh knew he had potential. At The Hague, 
he worked alongside the landscape painter Anton Morve. And at last, he began to work with oils. Girl in the Forest is one of the earliest Van Gogh paintings, which features the thick impasto brushwork that would be a feature of his mature work. The Loom is one of a number of early Van Gogh paintings depicting peasants at work. It is a very different kind of image from Vincent's well-known masterpieces. Again, the palette is dark, and unlike his later canvases, there is a sense of emotional involvement in the subject matter. When this canvas was completed in May 1884, Vincent had left The Hague, having grown frustrated with the emotional demands of Sien. Soon, he was back with his family, who had now moved to the village of Nunen. At times, his parents must have despaired of their eldest son. He was difficult and antisocial. He ate alone in the family home. His emotional difficulties also continued. In the summer of 1884, a local woman actually fell in love with the strange would-be artist. This time, it was Vincent who made the rejection, and the unfortunate woman attempted suicide as a result. Worse was to come in March 1885, when Pastor Van Gogh died. It was a major family loss, but Vincent's reaction was surprisingly cool. In a letter to Theo, he described how his father's death had simply prevented him working for a few days. Art was now everything for Vincent van Gogh, as he set about his most ambitious canvas to date, the potato eaters. It was his reaction to the, the condition of the poor working classes. It was almost like a 17th century Dutch work which is concerned with ordinary people, like the, the early 19th century, people like Courbet and Manet, who are concerned with the contemporary and the ordinary, when we think of the, of the Barbizon School, Millet. And indeed, there's, there's quite a few connections you can trace between the Barbizon School work of Millet, uh, uh, and Corot, and so forth, and those early works of Van Gogh, the potato ages. But it's Van Gogh's personal interpretation and reaction to the conditions in which he found himself, for instance, working in the Borinage as a missionary. Uh, it is therefore about Van Gogh. It's about the potato it is, but I, I think more than that, it's about Vincent. He was expressing his usual interest in the peasants, the working people, the underprivileged, and trying to portray them as realistically as he could, which was in the manner of previous Dutch painters. So he used these very dark, gloomy colours, partly because they were traditional colours in art, but also because they showed what it was like in the interior of one of those peasants' houses. And he was just trying to empathise with their situation and their poverty. The Potato Eaters can be seen as the culmination of Van Gogh's early development as a painter. But he knew he had to explore further, to expose himself to new influences, new ideas, new visions. It would be a short, frenzied journey that would lead to work of genius and a life of torment. By November 1885, Van Gogh already suspected that his time was running out. That month, he left his family and Holland for good. Over the following 56 months, he created his legend. Vincent arrived in the Belgian port of Antwerp to study at the Art Academy. But he also sought out his own influences. Antwerp was, and remains, home to many works by the Flemish master Peter Paul Rubens. Van Gogh was especially impressed with Rubens' bold handling of color and we can see the influence of Rubens in this portrait of a woman, painted shortly after Van Gogh's arrival in Antwerp. Van Gogh's new enthusiasm for colour was also inspired by a great artist from his own century. In his letters, Vincent described his fascination for a Frenchman whose colour theories made a deep impression on him. This was a giant figure of the Romantic age, Eugène Delacroix. The 19th century 
produced a whole series of theories of colour. Some of these were very abstract and academic, and indeed they really flowed into two main streams, one which was optical to do with light, um, which at, to a certain extent was concerned with painting. But then it merged in people like Delacroix and others, and for instance Sura and so on, we can see in practical terms in Pointillism, Divisionism, into um, new theories of colour or experiments or explorations of colour in terms of the painted colour as opposed to light. Delacroix's ideas about colour were that you don't have solid colour. Uh, an area, a surface of colour is broken up into different sorts of greens if it's lawn, for example, or different blues if you're painting a blue fabric. He also had some idea of complementary colours, reflections and so on. Colour and paint were being freed from the constraints of the past. And we see this developing. And again, we need to look at the works to look at the way starry skies or, or, or cornfields, where the whole impression of the cornfield or the starry night was conveyed by colour and its physical application and the contrast of one colour against another and the use of streaks of paint. All of this was part and parcel of what Van Gogh took. The colour theories of Delacroix influenced Van Gogh far more than anything he learnt at the Antwerp Academy. After just one term, he failed his examinations, having argued against the stuffy formalism of the curriculum. But Vincent had other things on his mind. He discovered Japanese art. I think what Van Gogh liked about Japanese art was the formal aspects. He also liked the exact draftsmanship and attention to detail. He said this. There's a painting by him of boats on the beach, which is a fantastic painting and very Japanese, not a Japanese subject, but the style is Japanese. He uses the diagonals. He uses areas of colour enclosed by not necessarily a clear outline. One colour is clearly differentiated from another, so you have patches of colour. And the whole thing is very tightly pulled together with attention, some attention to detail, and he has the exact shape of the boats in the most incredibly decorative fashion. And I think he just responded because of his sense of decoration, combined with his love of detail and an overall particular kind of tense, taut composition. And it's because of this that he responded so strongly to Japanese art. Van Gogh's passion for Japanese art would stay with him when he tired of life in Antwerp. In March 1886, Theo van Gogh was surprised to receive a message at the Paris branch of Goupil's, where he worked. It was from his brother, announcing that he was at the Louvre, awaiting Theo's arrival. Vincent van Gogh had come to Paris, and it was here that his greatness as an artist began. Though his arrival was sudden, Vincent had written to his brother explaining his desire to come to the centre of European artistic life. His plan was to study at the cheap, open studio of the academic painter Fernand Cormont. After moving in with Theo, he began to pursue his intention. But, like Antwerp, formal study did not inspire his art. It was a thrilling age for Parisian visual art. Amongst other events, 1886 saw the eighth of the famous exhibitions of Impressionist paintings. The revolutionary approach to colour, light and technique, pioneered by Monet, Renoir and others, was now beginning to be appreciated. Van Gogh liked the Impressionist practice of quick, open-air painting. And before long, he could be seen working around the Montmartre region where he lived with Theo. When Van Gogh came to Paris in 86, he was painting in the Dutch fashion, traditional fashion, dark colours, uh, traditional subjects, still lives and so on. And he, during his two years in Paris at that time, he came to know the Impressionists and uh, Seurat and the Divisionists. His 
brushwork loosened, his colour lightened and brightened, and he started painting landscapes in the Impressionist style, more or less. So it was a complete revelation to him to be among the Impressionist painters, and he absorbed a lot of what they were doing. The revolution of Impressionism was now being taken a stage further. The age of post-Impressionism was already beginning with the work of artists like Toulouse-Lautrec, Seurat and Signac. Van Gogh got to know them all. He became especially friendly with Signac and took a great interest in his dot technique of painting. This was the so-called pointillism pioneered by Seurat and which now included the great Impressionist Camille Pissarro amongst its practitioners. Pissarro also became an associate of Van Gogh and we can see the influence of the dot technique in much of his Parisian work. The re-exploration and the rediscovery of colour through colour theories, application of paint, how do we see, and divisionism or pointillism as seen yet particularly for Van Gogh, but also Seurat, we regard particularly as a major one, was where colour began to speak in a peculiar way, in its own way. That is that it is the way that the colour is seen by the eye and mixed in that, that, that space in between the canvas and the eye, which mattered. I mean, basically, pointillism is, is simply means painting in dots, and divisionism is a theory for the pointillism, which is that, again, to put it crudely, uh, instead of uh, painting an orange area by mixing on your palette yellow and red, what you do is you put dots of yellow and dots of red or in, intermingled, and your eye then mixes that, and it becomes orange in the space in between. Canvases like this 1887 still life reveal Van Gogh's enthusiasm for pointillism. But unlike his friend Pissarro, Vincent never allowed the technique to take over his work completely. There were too many other sources of inspiration for him. In Paris, he became acquainted with Paul Gauguin, an association that would ultimately lead to disaster. But in 1886 and 1887, Van Gogh was content to learn from Gauguin's bold use of flat, solid colour. We can see this in his copies of Japanese prints, another passion that remained with him during the Paris years. By 1887, Vincent was soaking up influences from a bewildering number of sources, but his personal life was still troubled. He was moody and temperamental, even with his fellow artists, he drank heavily and his health began to suffer. His beloved brother also grew frustrated at having to share a house with such a difficult individual. By the end of 1887, Vincent was tiring of Paris, but his time in the French capital had been of paramount importance for his art. If we look at the 1885 Potato Eaters and compare it with this 1887 portrait of the material supplier, Pere Tanguy, it's difficult to believe that they are the work of the same painter. The same is true when we consider this self-portrait created shortly after Vincent's arrival in Paris. If we jump forward less than two years, the sense of artistic evolution is remarkable. We get this really rather rapid trend from very dark paintings, superb, strong drawings, which continued, but it was the actual use of colour. I think if I had to think of anything which was, after his Paris days, developed, was his, his the explosion of colour. It's as if he'd suddenly realised that colour was important, that colour was in itself something through which he could convey emotion, uh, reaction, impression. By the time Van Gogh painted himself in early 1888, his two years in Paris had revolutionised his art. But he was still not satisfied. He was tired of city life and now sought to work in a warmer, lighter location 
where he could paint all day. His choice was the sunlit region of Provence. On the 20th of February, 1888, he took a train from Paris and journeyed south. His destination was the city of Arles. And it was in this Provencal community that the genius of Vincent van Gogh finally revealed itself. With the continuing support of Theo, he was able to work without distraction. As soon as he arrived in Arles, he launched himself into a frenzied working schedule. Sixteen-hour days were not uncommon as he turned out landscapes, still lifes and portraits. His execution was quick, but it was also deliberate and worked out in detail. He had now evolved his own artistic philosophy, which likened the art of painting to the art of music. And for Van Gogh, it was colour that provided the key. In one letter to Theo, he spoke of absolutely piling on, exaggerating the colour. His pigments were bold and intense, but they were also harmonised across the canvas, as we can see with this early Arl masterpiece, the Langlois Bridge. He uses a fairly limited palette in this painting. And again, bright colours, greens and yellows, an unusual combination, in fact. And he applies his colour with great confidence. We can discern this whole business of colour taking on its own force in these works. There is no way which you could go and sit down by one of those rivers and look at that bridge and say, ah, oh, this is where Van Gogh sat, and this is, the, this is the foliage, this is the way this bridge was painted, this was what the sky was like at the time, because colour has now taken off. And the strength of that bridge is incredibly strong. And that's part of the drawing, the underlying drawing, which is very strong. And so it's Vincent's reaction to, in a complicated and also to him, you know, his own personal way, reaction to the symbolism, that's important. It has links too with the Japanese prints and its simplicity. They're extremely powerful works. When Langlois Bridge was completed in March 1888, Vincent van Gogh had achieved full confidence in his art. But his handling of colour was about to become bolder still. A visit to the Mediterranean coast at Saint-Marie de la Mer inspired this stunning watercolour on his return to Arles. The blue-orange contrast is almost overwhelming, and yet the image succeeds as a unified whole. Paintings like this had never been seen before, and it's hardly surprising that Van Gogh could not sell any of his work. But by the summer of 1888, he was able to take studio space in an Arles property. And by September, he was renting the entire building, the so-called Yellow House. It was an appropriate name. Van Gogh was almost obsessed with the color yellow. When he was forced to write to Theo begging for paint, it was always yellow at the top of the list. For Van Gogh, yellow had spiritual and symbolic meaning, and he used the colour with abandon in his portraits, his sunlit landscapes and his still lifes. These included one of the most famous and technically daring works of his whole career, The Sunflowers, of August 1888. Vincent wrote to Theo that what he was after was the sun and sunlight. And we assume it's because of this that he was obsessed by yellow and different kinds of yellow, such as appear in the uh, National Gallery sunflowers. He just loved the vibrancy of the colour. In the sunflowers, this is a particular example, in the sunflower series, of which a major example is in the National Gallery in London, it goes against all the criteria of how a painting should be produced. It's all yellow. And yet, what we've got is something which is strongly three-dimensional, or the illusion of three dimensions. There's no perspective here. There's no sort of illusion of depth in a traditional sense. It's the use of colour and varieties of tone of one colour, that is, orange-yellow, plus a linear quality. And we come back again to this drawing. He's not afraid to use a dark, an indication of a dark line surrounding or separating 
and that gives a depth. I remember thinking for a long time, well, they don't really look like sunflowers. Then I realised that what we were looking at was not the sunflower in its early, sort of, just opening stage, uh, but when the petals had died off and we've got all the, uh, the sunflower seeds. The texture of those seeds is very different than, say, the texture of the pot, which you can almost feel that it's coloured slip, you know, with a nice shiny surface against a matte surface, of the, and then the wall. Van Gogh created a number of sunflower studies, and this version can now be seen in London's National Gallery. But it was originally hung on the wall in the artist's own home. It was intended as part of the decoration for a communal studio in the Yellow House. This was the so-called artist's colony that Vincent longed to establish, the Studio of the South. And his first fellow colonist would be Paul Gauguin. At the time, Gauguin was working on the Brittany coast and was initially reluctant to join his old friend in the south. But when the long-suffering Theo agreed to pay an allowance to Gauguin in addition to that of his brother, Vincent's fellow artist agreed to join him in Arles. Van Gogh was overjoyed. Vincent wanted artists to get together and cooperate, like he said, like the early Christians used to. And he wanted um, anyone to come and stay with him in Provence, actually, and Gauguin was the only one who was interested. Um, and they had had quite a lot to do with each other previously and admired each other's work. And he thought he could learn something from Gauguin. He put Gauguin in the position of the master or the teacher, which actually quite amazed Gauguin, who thought that Van Gogh was a powerful painter anyway, if not always a good one. Van Gogh started modifying the physical shape and colour of his subject matter to communicate ideas. With this canvas, the night cafe on the Place Lamartine, the artist's intention was to convey a sense of sleaze and criminal lowlife. In his own words, to express the terrible passions of humanity by means of red and green. The night cafe can also be seen as part of the artist's desire to capture the sublime nature of night itself. Shortly afterwards, Vincent created his first great outdoor canvas at night, the Café Terrace. According to legend, Van Gogh solved the physical problem of nocturnal painting by wearing a wide-brimmed, candle-lit hat. In September 1888, he created Starry Night, an image whose spiritual meaning is still considered today. This rich blue, much, much richer than in actual fact it would be, therefore it's not real in the traditional sense, interspersed with these extremely brilliant pinpoints of, of whitey yellow. And yet, these swirls of colour, it's not static. The whole thing is in movement. And one feels that this is Vincent's reaction to the night is one of constant movement of his reaction to that. This September 1888 canvas would not be the last Van Gogh painting to depict a starry night. But by the time he returned to the subject in June 1889, the resulting work was startlingly different, reflecting the traumatic events of the intervening months. Sadly, the winter of 1888-89 marked the beginning of the end for Vincent van Gogh, a time that would bring madness, persecution, and a legendary act of self-mutilation. And yet, in the autumn of 1888, everything seemed to be going well, despite van Gogh's continuing inability to sell any work. He had the arrival of Gauguin to look forward to, and the artist's peace of mind is reflected in his painting of his bedroom. In Vincent's room, the artist said that he wanted to convey a sense of absolute restfulness, to rest the brain or the imagination. But it would all go horribly wrong. Gauguin duly arrived at Arles in October 1888 and quickly settled in to the Yellow House. 
the two men began to work together as the winter dawned. For a while, Vincent's dream of a successful communal art seemed on the point of realization. His sewer was clearly influenced by Gauguin's extraordinary The Vision After the Sermon, a painting that he had brought south with him. But differences in personality proved decisive in the end. By December 1888, trouble was looming. The two men argued bitterly, and it became obvious that Gauguin would have to leave. Vincent's grand scheme was failing, and this may have been enough to push him over the edge of reason. Just before Christmas, Van Gogh threatened Gauguin with a razor. Gauguin fled, leaving his fellow artist distraught. That night, Vincent Van Gogh cut off a piece of his left ear. Precisely what happened, I don't think has yet actually emerged. A number of uh, theories have uh, come forward. One of them, I suppose two of the main ones, being one that his own sexual relationships were somewhat confused, and uh, as a result of one encounter, he cut off his ear and sent it off to a prostitute. The one which I think is more logical is a result of his argument with Goga and the failure of his setting up the, the colony. Uh, again emphasised by the fact and underlined dramatically by him painting his own self-portrait with his bandaged ear. The incident of the severed ear was a disaster for Van Gogh. Not so much for the mutilation itself, but because it marked the end of his relationship with Gauguin and the end of his hopes for an artist's colony. He was now mentally disturbed and suffered hallucinations during a brief stay in hospital. His doctors blamed overwork, but Vincent ignored them. In a matter of days, he was back at his easel, creating two heartfelt still-life paintings, one depicting his own chair with a pipe, the other depicting the chair of his fellow artist, Gauguin. Although Vincent still kept a candle burning for Gauguin, the idea of the artist's colony had failed, and he knew it. In the early months of 1889, the unknown Dutch artist found himself alone in the south of France. He had never made many friends in Arles. The postman, Joseph Roulin, was one of the few people whom he did know. But by the spring of 1889, the friend he depicted in this portrait had been transferred to another town. Vincent's life was now falling apart. Though he kept on working, he continued to hallucinate. He was also persecuted by his neighbors, 80 of whom signed a petition demanding the confinement of the madman in their midst. Vincent did have a mental disorder, a fact he accepted himself. In May 1889, he left Arles to enter the asylum at the nearby town of Saint-Rémy. There are various theories about Vincent's mental health at this time. He certainly suffered from paranoia, so schizophrenia might have been an element. The doctor he saw at that time thought he hadn't been eating properly, and this was probably true. He also might have been imbibing poison from some of his paints, especially the white. It's possible, and the most popular theory is that he suffered from some form of epilepsy. And there is a particular kind of epilepsy which results in, in between periods of perfect normality with periods of great depression, paranoia and violence, followed by periods of torpor and then a return to normality. We may never know the precise nature of Van Gogh's illness, but he believed that as long as he was able to work, his sanity was intact. And so he insisted on being able to paint during his confinement at saint Rame, Hallucinations and breakdowns continued to plague him, but in his lucid moments, he found the will to create a phenomenal 200 paintings in just 12 months. His subject matter was now forced upon him, the asylum itself, the surrounding grounds, fellow patients, his own tormented features. But his art was still evolving. It was in the asylum that he began to incorporate a new technical feature into his paintings. 
Only now did the famous swirling brushwork reveal itself in Van Gogh's paintings like The Cornfield from June 1889. It's difficult not to detect a sense of tortured personal expression in images like this. This is a modern artistic concept, perhaps best expressed when Vincent returned to the subject of the starry night. Completed in June 1889, it is a painting of the 20th century. He doesn't see the world as static in any way. Whether you see it as the cornfield in which the whole swirling of the corn, the swirling of the clouds and the thing, a starry night uh, with the swirling of the colour and the different layers, uh, lines of colour. Or be it in one of his last works, for instance, the, the chapel where you've got the road dividing and going either side of the chapel, which in itself is, is constantly in, in movement. He's restless and this restlessness is there. We are moving away from the adequacy of words to convey uh, what is happening. The adequacy is often, and it certainly as it got going, more adequate expressed in mute terms of music. You could relate to uh, pieces of music and sections of music and areas of music, uh, which more properly and adequately reflect what was happening, say, in Starry Night. Nobody did it quite as intensely somehow as Van Gogh did. And using the paint in, in this particularly lavish way that he used as well is something which showed um, an awareness of paint as a medium, which is something that was also developed in the 20th century. The Expressionist movement, for example, there was a great uh, desire to use brushstroke and paint to express emotions um, of varying intensity. As Rewald says, he wanted to liberate himself from overpowering emotions. And Van Gogh, in a letter to Theo, said he was using exaggeration in order to convey feelings, and he was also using the techniques of old woodcuts. So it was quite a conscious departure from the sort of paintings he was used to painting, and very successful as such, in fact. The great swirling skies and flame-like trees. It's a very, very intense painting and certainly gives you a feeling of the energy that, that is, can be seen sometimes in the sky at night. Not long after completing the starry night, he broke down again at Saint-Rémy. Through the rest of 1889, he endured breakdowns followed by periods of sanity when he was able to paint images like this, self-portrait. Here, we can surely see a man finally cracking under the strain, a man whose life had been nothing but failure. Thankfully, there was some good news to come. In early 1890, an article appeared praising Van Gogh's work. The same month, Theo was able to inform his brother of the sale of this painting, The Red Vineyard, for the sum of 400 francs. It would be the only Van Gogh purchased during the artist's lifetime. In the end, the saint Remy Asylum could do nothing for Vincent Van Gogh. Increasingly lonely, the artist decided to leave Provence altogether. In May 1890, he arrived at auvers sur oise a village near Paris, under the supervision of Paul Ferdinand Gachet, a doctor who was also a friend of Vincent's old associate, Pissarro. For a while, the move seemed to do him good. Works like The Church at Auvers revealed that the artist's work was still evolving, though this would not be appreciated in his own lifetime. The painting of Dr. Gachet provides a poignant example of Van Gogh's final works. A hundred years later, it was sold for the sum of 45 million pounds to become the most expensive painting ever. And this is not the only Van Gogh canvas whose financial value is measured in tens of millions. There's value, that is artistic value, or value historically on the one hand, and value in a monetary sense. And art historians and those who claim to be um, arbiters of taste have, uh, have lauded uh, Van Gogh, so that uh, if you are a collector, you must have a Van Gogh. And if you've got enough of those vying against each other, the prices are going to go up.
into their millions as they are now. The emotional power of Van Gogh's works maybe is what appeals to those buyers who are prepared to spend such enormous sums of money apart from fashion. But in our society where so many feelings are not allowed or are repressed, works of art which show the feelings simply bursting out could be very releasing and I wonder if it's something to do with the sheer power of the feelings in his works which have made them so universally popular. It may be the ultimate tragedy of Vincent van Gogh that he himself would never know the value that future generations would place upon his artistic achievement. On July the 27th, 1890, at Auvers-sur-Oise, the still unknown painter took a revolver and shot himself. Two days later, with Theo at his side, he died of his injuries. After 37 years, he was finally at peace. But there was one more tragedy to come. Six months later, Theo also died, to be buried alongside the man he had supported so selflessly in life. Perhaps the greatest of all the post-impressionists, Vincent van Gogh. I think Vincent was a very great artist. He followed his own feelings, his own intuitions, which is what an artist is supposed to do. And he followed them to the nth degree. I see uh, the impetus for the 20th century rooted in the three figures of Cézanne, Gauguin and Van Gogh. The enthusiasm, the humanity, the concern for the human condition uh, of Van Gogh, which of course led to some major work still continues, a strand uh, through Munch and the Expressionists.